guest now. <laughs> in fact, uh, my paper is about surveillance. When the Cold War started, um, communism had a good reputation in the West as far as culture was concerned. The Americans were very worried uh, to see how attracted artists and intellectuals were to communism, and they massively invested in Western arts, culture, and intellectual life. But in fact, no one succeeded at demonstrating that the West was defending cultural freedom better than the communist regimes themselves. The Americans had in fact not need worry. Stalinism in its post-48 version exerted censorship and intimidation. All critical intellectuals were silenced when they were not thrown in jail, sent to labor camps, or executed. When intellectuals were not censored, it is more often than not because they censored themselves. A culture of both surveillance and self-surveillance was thus created. Is this culture of surveillance representative only of the communist dictatorship? Let us enlarge both the geographical scope and the time frame to compare and contrast it with the situation in the West, uh, that is, with us today. The theme of surveillance has indeed become a source of concern in the past decade for a much wider audience than academic historians of communism. Um, the WikiLeaks scandal with Julian Assange in 2006 or the 2013 revelations by Edward Snowden, former employee of the National Security Agency, have revived the issue of individual freedom versus state and corporate bodies. They have shown the massive extent of state and corporate surveillance exerted on citizens. The notion of secret has practically disappeared in our contemporary society. According to David Lyon, one might now even speak of a new surveillance culture that has become a whole way of life. Moreover, notes the author, it is something that everyday citizens comply with, wittingly and willingly or not, negotiate, resist, engage with, and in novel ways, even initiate and desire. This astute observation on the voluntary or semi-voluntary character of the people's apparent compliance doubtless comes as a shocking revelation to the Western public today. And the same David Lyon is justifiably worried by the fact that this mode of social discipline or control is now internalized and forms parts of everyday reflections on how things are and of the repertoire of everyday practices. But such a way of life with all its intricacies was familiar to the tens of millions of people who were living behind the Iron Curtain until 1989. As Havel already remarked in the 1970s, societies living under communism were at the forefront of the particular aspect of modernity that is surveillance culture. Eastern Europe was at least as postmodern or post-totalitarian, as Havel put it, as Western Europe, despite looking increasingly weak from an economic point of view. The main culprit was not what is today, that is the technologically enhanced mode of social discipline or control, but the eternal version of humankind itself and its guilty pleasure concerning social control and the police supervision. That is the famous trilogy, spying, surveilling, denouncing. How did the state of surveillance come about? It originated from the fact that the communist regime lied constantly and about everything. It falsified the past, the present, and the future. It falsified statistics and pretended not to possess an omnipotent and unprincipled police apparatus. It pretended to respect human rights and to persecute, no, to persecute no one. It pretended to fear nothing and it pretended to pretend nothing. All this was the deconstruction of Havel in his iconic 1978 essay, The Power of the Powerless. Given that everyone was aware of this constant lie, Havel posits that the populations living under the communist regime had to make a choice. They could either accept to live within this lie or they could refuse to endorse this, what he calls mystification. Most people did endorse it, which in turn provided justification for the system. For, I'm quoting Havel, by this very fact, individuals confirm the system, fulfill the system, make the system, are the system. In other words, by conforming to what was expected of them, people unwittingly, unwittingly perpetuated their own domination. They created a new norm that brought pressure on their fellow citizens, and they learned to live within it as the new normality. Eventually, says Havel, by pulling everyone into its power structure, the post-totalitarian system makes everyone an instrument of a mutual totality 
the auto totality of society. In this case, I would actually um, translate what he called auto totality by rather by self totalitarianism. If the people were not only objects, but also subjects of their own domination, if they were both victims of the system and its instruments, um, and its own instruments, then the issue at stakes are more complex than opposing the heroes and victims of communist surveillance. Surveillance must be redefined within the context of the relationship between the state and society, between rulers and ruled. This operation is all the more delicate when applied to communist history that we have to rely on regime sources. And that's why I'm so interested in what James has to say. The visual and material world that we inherited was in many ways curated by the secret police itself and deposited in the archives for a contextualized or decontextualized analysis. The files unwittingly perpetuate the communist will to maintain control over history writing by determining the access to archival material and information. A new relationship has to be established between the producers of this sort, the secret police, and the recipients, that is us. This knowledge has to be situated. As the audience of these reports, we engage in a social process with imagined actors. We constantly redefine in the present the significance of this past phenomena. But how do we even define culture, surveillance, and dictatorship in this context? Are we speaking of culture under surveillance or rather of a culture of surveillance? According to the Oxford Dictionary, culture is the idea, customs, and social behavior of a particular people or society. Surveillance, on the other hand, is defined in the Cambridge Dictionary as the careful watching of a person or place, especially by the police or army, because of a crime that happened or is expected. And there indeed was a communist idiosyncrasy, the consideration on the part of the rulers that any behavior that was not strictly fulfilling the regulation of the prescribed ideology was potentially or effectively criminal and had to be dealt with by the repressive secret police. We now know, thanks to Havel and later on, thanks to a number of anthropologists, historians, and literary scholars, that this surveillance was not exerted only by the rulers over the ruled, but also by the ruled over each other. The archives allow us to dismiss the notion that there were two clear poles of behavior and show on the contrary that dissent, dissent was tinged or tainted with collaboration and vice versa. Libora Otsindrukova has shown, for instance, in her study of censorship practices in Hungary and Czechoslovakia under communist rule, that the production of knowledge was not universally con controlled by the state. Instead, I'm quoting her, elaborate systems of negotiations and self-censorship, replaced over time the strict ideological restrictions of the first year, the first years, sorry. Sonia Combe has shown that the cultural opposition was sometimes rooted in the milieus of critical Marxist reform communist intellectuals themselves, who sympathized with the Communist Party or were even prominent members. She calls them the loyal dissidents. Barbara Fox, Falk even claims that there was no clear cut line between resistance and dissent, but that it was more of a continuum of full spectrum. She establishes that attitudes such as a deliberately low productivity or retreat into the private sphere of family activity were also potential forms of resistance, even if they don't classify as varieties of dissent. In this context, can we describe everyday life under communism as a way of life under close observation? Is it even possible to monitor someone's entire life? How does it affect the people under consideration? How does one escape this monitoring? How do we account for this everyday experience ex post facto? Also, another question, is surveillance the demonstration of criminal activity on the part of the regime? or should we consider it as more intimately linked with the phenomena, phenomenon of collaboration and denunciation, that is, including the population's own contribution to the dictatorship? And in that case, should we rather attempt to lead the sociology of informants or informants? Moreover, how do we account for the complexity of communist rule from within the post-communist public spheres? <clears throat> 
The activism of the conservative right has progressively imposed the memory of communism as strictly negative and pregnant with massive violence, a moral imperative that is difficult to reconcile with the academic critical mind. As Slavomir Sharakovsky put it, the Central European debate has moved from right against left to right against wrong. However, historians of communism have to question the kind of society and way of life that constant surveillance generates. In fact, we should move um, with my thesis from the question of culture under surveillance to that of a culture of surveillance. The key feature in this culture being that the people actively participate in an attempt to regulate their own surveillance and the surveillance of others. There is growing evidence of patterns of perspectives, outlooks of mentality, mentalities on surveillance, along with some closely related modes of uh, imitating, negotiating, or resisting surveillance that can be referred to as surveillance imaginaries and surveillance practices. And actually, this was a quote that I just gave you, but these words were not written to describe communist society. They were, described, they were used to describe our contemporary Western one. So this, um, they, they raise in both the past communist and the present democratic instances a crucial issue, that is the participation of the people. What was dissent? In Havel's words, it was a specter haunting Eastern Europe, the opening words of the already cited essay, The Power of the Powerless, which, as Jonathan Bolton uh, notes, was an invocation of Marx and Engels' 1848 Communist Manifesto, but laced with subver subversive ironies. Just like in Marx's definition of communism, dissent was as much a construction fantasized by the old order as a genuine threat. The distorting effect of surveillance was underlined already under communism by dissidents themselves. Milan Cimecka noted in his famous volume, The Restoration of Order of 1984, that the constant attention of the secret police provided an, an extra form of prestige to the dissidents' activity that might not have been entirely warranted. His own definition of surveillance as a grotesque activity involving a large number of secret policemen underlines the disproportioned material and human cost of this visible surveillance, whose intention is to intimidate the person followed. With the money spent by the regime on the needless apparatus that surrounded him, Shivechka calculated that he and his family could live well for years. He and Zdena Tomin have both underlined that this infamous fame bestowed upon dissidents was unhealthy. The latter were demeaned, but also elevated by this constant attention. And it's yet again a point that I think might be very relevant for the present. But at least dissidents did know that they were surveilled. They could and did take countermeasures of secrecy. On the other hand, and crucially, surveillance also affected people who were not aware that they were being followed. Um, and because they were caught unprepared and were not part of any network, they are also those who suffered most from the repressive dimension of surveillance. In fact, says James Capello, this really brilliant guy that we heard of, the notion of surveillance invites us to reflect on the dialectic between the visible and the invisible. The identity of the secret agents was not necessarily secret. Rather, the latter managed a performance of secrecy that inspired both fascination and fear. Christina Batulescu, that I found thanks to James, deconstructs after Hannah Arendt the secrecy histrionics of the communist regime as applied um, in the iconic show trial. I'm quoting um, Batulescu. In a dramatic illustration of Hannah Arendt's theory that in totalitarian societies, the spectacle of secrecy was necessary to camouflage the absence of a secret, this spectacle of secrecy was, as its height, meant to frame the uncovering of the fabricated anti-Stalinist plot, unquote. Catherine Dordery similarly described the ubiquitous presence of the Romanian secret police in everyday life. I'm quoting her. Although in Secrets and Truths, which is her previous book, um, I took the invisibility of the Securitate at face value, I am now learning that in some senses, it was not invisible at all. People, people could see the officers responsible for their work unit or the guys hanging out in places where potential dissidents might congregate, unquote. In fact, it was enough for the secret policemen to be seen and recognized to have the status of secrecy lifted 
Their simple presence affected people's behavior, and this in turn fashioned the state security into a preventive institution. Those who faced the harshest moral choices are not the dissidents, but those who agreed to inform whilst doing their best to withhold uh, harmful or damaging information. Well, at least if we suppose that dissidents did not inform, which is a bit of a stretch because in fact, some of them also did inform, but okay. Um, unsurprisingly, uh, these people who tried to, um, who did not dare to refuse informing, but also did not try not to harm anyone, were often tragic victims of the moment of revelation when, after 1989, leaked lists of secret police collaborators exposed them to the public as informants. These lists, uh, lists were stolen from the Ministry of Interior archives or transmitted to the public by anti-communist activists who deemed it the civic duty at the time when the archives were not open to the public yet. As a result, individual citizens found themselves pilloried by public opinion but could not defend themselves by arguing over the contents of their alleged betrayal since they had no access to their own files. Those who could afford to and who were sufficiently determined or had enough capital um, sued the Ministry of the Interior to have their records erased, which happened in the vast majority of cases. But the others endured the ruin of their personal reputation and experienced the post-communist period as unjust and unforgiving. Czech author uh, Josef Skoretsky wrote a touching novel in 1996 to describe his wife's shark. Zdena Salivarova was downgraded from hero to traitor from the moment when her name appeared on the list of Czech collaborators to the secret police in 1992. She sued and eventually won her trial, but she never fully recovered from this trauma. Yet another category of citizens would experience a delayed frustration those who came to retrospectively believe once the regime fell that they could and should have done more to oppose it. Often they came from the gray zone between opponents and the ordinary people, and they had resigned themselves to conformity in the face of repression. They were acutely portrayed in the character of Staniek in Václav Havel's 1978 play, Protest. Staniek is offered by his friend Vanyek to sign a protest in support of the dissidents. Staniek, who acts here as the representative of the gray zone, leads a long monologue in which he weighs the pros and cons of his eventual decision. And he closes his reflection on the, comment, on the following words, I'm quoting, do I prefer the inner liberation which my signature is going to bring me or do I choose the other alternative, my bitter awareness that I've again missed the chance to shake off the bonds of shameful compromises in which I've been choking for years, unquote, question mark. To both protagonists, the answer is perfectly clear. Vanyak fully believes Staniak will sign and Staniak knows that he won't. Bitter awareness is the killer keyword here, one that would doubtless still torment Staniak 11 years later when Vanyak would not only have kept his conscience clear, but would become president for it. When the past really, um, when the past really can contribute to the present, in its methodological reflection concerning the hidden surveillance is that um, we can make it visible, the, 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 the structure of this surveillance also today. Following Catherine Vergery, James Capello, still this brilliant guy who's so influencing my work, suggests at least two avenues in his own paper. Um, the first one that he didn't mention now, well, I'm not completely. The first one consists in restituting emotion via feelings and experience a reflective process of making sense of emotions whilst also standing back and analyzing the effects of surveillance on the individual um, and her or his social relations. And the second avenue that is even more audacious and counterintuitive concerning the repressive dimension of communism consists in studying forms of socialization between the secret agent and his informer and that sometimes even evolved into something resembling incredibly friendship. Catherine Verdere tells an amusing anecdote in this context, <clears throat> and that is that um, a Romanian poet was given the rare privilege to buy tomatoes from the vendor by virtue of his dissident fame. The Securitate agents who were watching the scene were envious and begged him to get some more for them too. So the poet went back and got more tomatoes for the secret police handlers. This question of the relationship between handler and informant found yet another echo in Bulgaria. Um, 
when filmmaker Božina Panayotova went back to Bulgaria, uh, to the Bulgaria of her origins, after having grown up in France, she convinced her mother to ask uh, if the mother had a secret police file. The mother complied, but with great discomfort. Otherwise, but you know, she wanted to help her daughter to reconstruct this past that had escaped her. In fact, they were both shocked to discover that the mother did uh, have a file and was listed as a collaborator by a good friend of hers, whom she had believed to be a cultural functionary, whereas he was in fact a full-time secret policeman. He had, unbeknownst to her, pumped her for information and introduced the little she knew as coming from his informant. There again, a parallel with the contemporary world can be found in the paternal feelings entertained by a Shin Bet agent for his teenage Palestinian informant in the film Bethlehem uh, of Yilval Adler in 2013, until the kid, kid caught up in a contradictory social solidarities um, uh, murders him. And I was thinking also uh, I could add a reference to the um, to the new um, to the, the series, the Israeli series called Fauda, where also uh, I think it was in the first season or second season, I forgot, but the, the main Shin Bet agent uh, yeah, had, um, had a very uh, intense personal relationship with a young Palestinian informer. And yeah, it also ends by death, but it's also uh, very interesting. In any case, the notions of negotiation, favors, relationship, or even deal are better suited at describing the agent informant encounter than simple surveillance. And so I'm coming to my conclusion, James. But since you said uh, the, you you started by giving the example of speaking much too long, you're not entitled anymore to stop me. You see, that's, that's yeah. So, but I'm at the conclusion. It's a long conclusion, though. So be patient. Um, some of the characteristics that observers like to attribute to the communist countries are not valid for this type of rule only. Surveillance has, been, surveillance has been endorsed by various types of regime, be it Hong Kong, India, United Arab Emirates. Uh, there again, I uh, strongly recommend this film, Playtime by uh, Isaac Julian, that shows, um, among others, um, uh, it's, it's so well acted that I thought it was a documentary, it was actually a film, so quite amazing. It's a future film, um, but it shows, among others, uh, Filipino uh, made uh, in Dubai is absolutely fascinating and the way she she's experiencing this constant surveillance by by her employers um, but also as I said in the beginning we have this question uh, acutely posed in Western democracies it would be a mistake to assume that the difference between the US today and former communist regimes only lies in the rule of law as Milan Shemechka also also observed under communism search warrants bore uh, the official uh, round step from, from the judge, you know, the police tried not to break anything during house searches. They were careful not to steal anything, but their legalism served an absurd world of meaning. They searched for writings as if confiscating writings could make the thoughts disappear. They operated according to the same stupid mentality that was so well described in um, uh, The World According to Garp by John Irving. Uh, published in the same year, incidentally, as The Power of the Powerless, that is 1978. When two villains raped an 11-year-old uh, girl, Ellen James, they cut her tongue off in a futile attempt to prevent her from telling on them, as if she could not restitute their names or describe what happened to her in any other way than by talking. The dumb villains got caught, and likewise, communism fell, but our current societies are still thriving under the watchful eye of both governments and big tech companies. The second reason why today's Western democracies remind us of the past communist dictatorships concerning surveillance more than we would like to think is the conformity or in the conformity that they managed to extract from their populations. Any government defines the rules of conduct within a country. From that point on, as Milan Shemechka has shown, I'm quoting him, as soon as people begin to accept these rules and act in accordance with them, their behavior not only strengthens the regime, it even begins to reproduce it. They may consider the regime bad, imbecilic, and dictatorial, they may not believe in it, and they certainly do not uh, recognize it as their own. Or at least it was so under communism. Today, of course, they do recognize it as their own. But nevertheless, by their behavior, they prolong its existence and contribute to its development. 
This discussion of submissive behavior meets the one evoked by Havel with the behavior of his greengrocer character in The Power of the Powerless, and it raises a fundamental question, that of legitimacy. Why did people not rebel against civilians that they knew or suspected was exerted against them? Why did they pretend to go on with their lives? Why did they gratify the regime with an implicit support by failing to deploy their negative feelings? The redefi redefinition of the sense not only of legitimacy, but of normalcy, turns out in our current world infused by post-truth to still be a very actual question. Echoing Havel, Edward Snowden remarks that today people are still powerless to stop surveillance on the part of the government and the corporate sector. It is intriguing and perhaps frightening that our societies are even willing to embrace technologies such as the smart speaker that essentially functions as an open microphone in their home, which is a chilling new development, but would have been the wet dream of secret police agents, right? We might also remark that with the current proliferation of public space cameras, surveillance has become a form of culture that the Western public seems to be condoning without a blink. In fact, the independent documentary film, Nothing to Hide by Marc Meyasu, 2017, this film analyzes the general acceptance of surveillance practices by the wider public through the I have nothing to hide argument, one that the film convincingly deconstructs as naive and mistaken. The next stage we should be wary of has already been described already by uh, Denat Tomin or <laughs> at the beginning of the 80s. When we realize we're surveilled, we go from censorship to self-censorship. And that is the lesson to ponder in our global future. Meanwhile, my last point, the 2020 COVID crisis has brought us yet another warning as to the remarkable facility with which societies can be led to accept extensive and invasive surveillance practices when or if they can be uh, successfully convinced that their lives are at stake. Relinquishing large parts of the autonomy has proven worryingly easy. The top-down injunctions to behave for the common good, that is to radically uh, limit citizens' freedom of movement, refrain them from leading their preferred activities, restrict their social contacts, isolate their children and their elder, elderly parents from society, cover their faces, uh, register their name and address whenever, wherever they go, um, or lead them to consent to be traced. All these are eerily reminiscent of life under a communist dictatorship. But there is worse. Such injunctions and the notion of imminent and serious danger to human life that has been pummeled on their citizenry by almost all governments have almost immediately led, and this in every society, to waves of control and self-control, spying on each other and denunciations to the police for any behavior deemed improper. Moreover, the governments have been empowered to control the citizens in the scale unheard of in peacetime uh, for our democratic, democratic societies. It has alarmingly led to a dehumanization of Western society and shows more than ever how fragile we are and how easy totalitarian surveillance can be. In some countries, full powers have even been granted to the government, um, while citizens' rights have been curtailed, first and foremost LGBTQ rights, but also the rights to demonstrate and protest, for instance. So fear can justify almost everything in the eyes of most people, even enlightened citizens, no matter what regime they live in. This is the chilling message communism can tell us about what it's like to live in a society of surveillance. But it's also maybe a way, today's situation is also a way to show how easy it can have been either, even under communism, to um, bring people to accept the state of domination. And I'm finished. Thank you, Muriel. Um, that was extremely interesting. Um, so we have, um, according to the schedule, we'd have about four minutes for questions, but I suggest we, we go to coffee 10 minutes later, giving us 15 minutes, and then we just kind of um, uh, try and make up time later on, maybe, if that's okay with everybody. Thomas, would like, does anyone have a question to kick off with? Well, the, 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 an opinion or a comment rather than question, because, you know, it's a very inspiring but uh, on the other hand it's also very simplifying thesis you you drive so that's why I was a little bit puzzled because it's very short text and 
many ideas. So that's why it, it wasn't, you know, I had a very short time, I have to admit, to, to read the text. So <laughs> that's why I, I, I was a little bit, you know, puzzled by certain points. I don't know if, well, we will not analyze them or I will open up for further discussion, but I think, you know, that, that uh, still question of guilt dominates somehow. And uh, I, I would suggest maybe, you know, because you, you switch the perspective completely from culture of uh, under surveillance uh, and culture of surveillance, for example, it's a very, very important switch for me. And therefore I was ready, you know, to, to read about the first one, uh, about our topic, actually, culture, culture under surveillance. And this is, that's why it became more complicated than expected, so to say. Okay, and uh, th th therefore I would s r rather suggest, you know, instead of uh, leaning too much on parallels and similarities, so some kind of inspiration we can get from our project, you know, so, so is it really relevant because there are important differences between times. You start in the 1950s and you conclude by uh, the, 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 the corona period, you know, and COVID period. So, so there are very important uh, differences as well. Uh, you mentioned them, of course, you don't ignore them, but I would like to suggest that maybe it could be interesting instead of concluding that, uh, or, or with that kind of simplification, maybe provoke questions, what can we learn if we compare the different periods? You know, a little bit more open, because I understood this to be an introductory text, actually, that introduces the topic. Okay, so it would be like, what can we learn while, while comparing these periods? And also learning from differences, because these parallels are very much, I'm using them as well, because I started with 1984, uh, you know, in the framework of communist regime, and now students tell me completely different interpretations, which are fascinating. So that's, I am not, you know, against it. But I, I, I mean, you know, the text is uh, short, but very, yeah, uh, very complex. So I, I, I would suggest that you simply provoke more questions rather than conclude something specific. Yes, that's my opinion. But again, take it uh, as, as, as a spontaneous opinion because I had really very short time to read that text, your text. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. So um, <clears throat> thank you very much for mentioning the question of guilt. Uh, you're right, it dominates throughout the paper and I never want to speak about it. It's like the big, it's the elephant in the room in my paper. So thank you so much for bringing my attention to that. Of course, it's something I should be um, centrally talking about. Um, otherwise, you, um, you're right, it used to be an introduction. Uh, it used to be the introduction to our, to our joint report. Um, and <clears throat> we decided to turn it into a paper and to write another introduction uh, together with uh, Jose and James. <clears throat> so I kind of converted this introduction into its own paper and of course uh, there's still, you pointed out, there's still remnants of it that are not, uh, yeah, that I still need to, to work on. And that's, all, that's also why it's too short. Uh, it's not short on purpose, it's short because I didn't have time to make it longer yet. Um, so yeah, it's probably too packed with uh, things, which is uh, usually the case in my text. So by making it a bit longer, I hope to make it more readable too. Um, but um, otherwise, it is my aim to say what we can what can we learn if we compare different periods. So if it didn't if it didn't come across sufficiently, my mistake. But that's the that's the goal. That's definitely the goal is to show uh, both um, how the the past can teach us about the present and the present can teach us about the past. And what the past can teach us about the present is, of course, uh, what happens when you submit a society. Uh, to surveillance practices. Well, we know very well what happens. It is extensively described, and that, that's why I uh, described at length or reported at length. Uh, but also, um, to me, it's uh, quite uh, illuminating what is happening right now around Corona, retrospectively about communism. It's like the um, I had always wondered, for instance, why in 1948 communists, uh, sorry, uh, intellectuals, had embraced so easily a dictatorship that was 
so stringent? Like, why did they fall into Stalinism with such facility? Why did they uh, support regimes that were frankly horrible? Uh, why, why did, you know, there, there was, Pavel Kohout was calling for the uh, uh, dog's death for the, for the dogs, you know, speaking about Slansky and company. So like, how can you uh, be so radical for people that turned out later to be really great writers, really great intellectuals. Like, how could they be so dumb, like so blinded, you know? I've, I've always wondered about that. And now I see it with Corona. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the effect of fear is incredible. It's like, it's like transforming people's minds, people's brains into uh, something completely different. Like I've seen friends be, you know who were critical intellectuals turn overnight into the greatest supporters of the orders the governments are giving or like uh, abolish entirely any form of uh, critical mind uh taking for granted everything that like and be, it's because of fear right it's because they feel this acute danger to their own lives uh and all of a sudden it made me understand like yeah in 1948 they they had also fear a very different kind of fear uh, in the Czech case, I'm sure every country had their own sources of fear in the Czech Republic or in Czechoslovakia it was uh, because of the return of the Germans, uh, because the, you know, the, the last German has, had barely left the country, uh, the last expelled German, and uh, until uh, at least in 56 when I read the archives of the secret police that are so useful for that respect as a, exactly as James said, as a kind of ethnography of, of the population. The, the mention that the Germans are coming back and they're coming to kill us all, uh, they're all coming back to cut our throats, was still something very pregnant in, in the Czech um, public, or well, it's not public opinion, popular opinion, let's say. Yeah? So there was a very strong fear too. And that justified a lot of the extreme dogmatism that we saw at the time. So, but the, I mean, and this I kind of knew, of course, uh, theoretically, I knew because I studied it and so on, but with Corona, I saw it with a renewed accuracy, like, how intellectuals can become all of a sudden uh, kind of abolish their role of intellectuals, yeah? So uh, that's, yeah, that's, but the, the Corona conclusion I added on Monday, to be honest. It's not something I, I mean, I was thinking about the Corona issue for a long time, um, for the past six months, but I've been doing little else, but reading about Corona the whole day, studying uh, the reactions of the people and so on. But, it, had, it was kind of illumination for me on Monday, well before I sent you my papers, that, oh, it's so linked. It is so exactly the same uh, issue for me, in my mind. So there's something I will uh, maybe extend. Maybe I'll make a third part of my paper to make the paper longer, too. Um, it will become probably the, actually the main point of the article in the end. So thanks so much. I have a kind of question stroke well no no it's a, it's a it's a comment i guess but might lead to me might lead to a question when i start to uh, uh express it um so in the, in this kind of comparative endeavor uh, the thing that always kind of um comes to my mind is the is the relationship between what is you know what is feared and and what the what the cost is in terms of freedom and you know the the current corona debate is very much around okay the the, the extent to which you fear the virus measured against the in, the economic impact for example and we see this you know in the in the united states um <clears throat> and doesn't this isn't this a mirror also of what was happening in 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 during communism that you know the the kind of um fear but also the compromises you're prepared to make in relation to a really desired for uh, stability, which included, you know, uh, economics, having something to eat, having a job, having, you know, um, so there's a kind of a, a similar kind of dialectic going on between those polarities. And um, in the middle of that is the, you know, the concept of freedom, because if you're, if you, if you, if you, if you're, if you're thinking, you know, what, what does surveillance do, if it impinges on a notion of freedom, something really interesting, you know, the, um, I read it on, on online. I can't remember who who said it now. Recently, that everything, everything that has the label freedom in the United States is bad. In in the context of the re response to coronavirus, so every time freedom is invoked, it's actually not a common good. It's a common bad. Um, so again, in, in the comparison, you know, I think um, 
what what would what would qualify as a common good for the type the two different times that you're comparing or is there any comparison in terms of what is a a common good so i'm rambling on a bit but there's another one more point i want to make which is around conformity as well um because at one point you said we you know we 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 conform but i think what's telling in relation to to the current crisis we conform in different ways uh, in different western democracies very you know and i'm sure there's a difference between czech republic and, and ireland very much a difference between U ireland and the uk and definitely with the united states and this is again to to do with you know i i i witnessed the kind of um the, re the rejection of restrictions um the powerful rejection of restrictions by certain you know certain quarters in in society as indication that we you know actually it's not working in the same way it did before. Um, you know, um, America is divided more or less down the middle, a slight, slight sort of um, kind of majority towards Biden, probably we think at the moment. We'll wait and see in the election. But in terms down down this line of you know, do we do we take what the government says? Um, and and the irony there is that as Trump is in power, he's the government, and yet you know that's that the fault line can still appear. And it, I was thinking, you know, about the kind of online world as well where you know everyone is trying to be woke and 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 the the critique that comes from that kind of uh, radical right is that you know that that is the surveillance that's the that's the police on the way we think and the way we um behave and not you know um not not um not what comes from not what comes from you know um right-wing politics um, or conservative politics, which is trying to impose genuine, in my view, genuine constraints on, on the way people can behave and act and so on in society. Um, so I don't know, I, I don't know if that's, that's useful at all, but I think, you know, that, 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 that idea of, you know, okay, what, what, is, what is at stake? What is the thing against which people are um, moving to, to conform or moving to um, reject and or compromise, you know, um, is also, you know, in the comparison, it needs to come out somehow, I think. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is much too smart again. Um, <laughs> well, well, how am I supposed to answer to it? Uh, but, um, you're asking what is the common good? And are you asking what is the common good in the, from the point of view of the discourse of the leaders? Or are you asking what is the common good for real? I'm asking for what is the common good against what which we're measuring, how people are responding to, to surveillance or constrictions or whatever, because we're, 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 we're saying, you know, they, they conform or they, they resist or they, but, but, you know, against, against, you know, or for what? Um, yeah, so, um, so a fear. I, mean, the I, thing I understand that as being more like what is the common good from the point of view of the discourse and mm. um, I think what is in common between the past and the present uh, about the notion of common good is um, a sense of solidarity like what, how do we define uh, the way uh, society should behave in a solidary way in order to benefit, uh, benef benefit the collective rather than the individual yeah? and, and there it's uh, uh, it, we know already under communism it was so easy to, to, to get a warp sense of solidarity because of course the regime to say solidarity is for you to participate to the nation as we define it. But what is different today? It's exactly the same. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's, uh, and Corona exactly shows that you can so easily warp this sense of necessary solidarity. Like um, I would have uh, subversive thoughts on the on, on the way our Western societies have defined what is necessary. But let's not go into uh, anything controversial. Uh, we can take an example that is easy to understand for everyone, and I don't think any, any of us would be against it. It's like, how is that a way to behave in a necessary, uh, necessary solidarity, um, uh, sense of social solidarity by forbidding transgender people, as happened in Hungary? Yeah. In the middle of the corona crisis, using the corona crisis, in the name of the fight against corona, the Hungarian government forbade transgender people. I think that is at least, I think, a very clear abuse of how you can use 
the notion that you need a common solidarity response from the people and turn it into something that is eminently political, has nothing to do with the corona, um, and is basically helping the government to implement its own power. And that, that I think is the crux of my point. I think it would strengthen the paper if you were able to strengthen that, that point of comparison, because you're dealing with Hungary, you're dealing with a post-communist society. Um, so, um, you know, the, in relation to Czech Republic, Poland, Hungary, what's going on now in the coronavirus and how the population is responding, it gives you a really, really strong frame of reference. Yeah. So I would, yeah, kind of, but it doesn't necessarily for the UK. What I, you know, for example, what you observe in the UK is during the first lockdown, people were like, yeah, sure, right. And people were informing on their neighbors, left, right and center and, and the police were knocking on doors. The second lockdown now, which is happening, you see, you know, whole cities, you know, resisting cross cross party resistance from MPs based on, and this is my question, what's the common good based largely on economics. Like, yeah, we just don't care anymore about mm -hmm. the, the science, as you're telling it, the epidemi uh, epidemiology, we care about, you know. Yeah, uh, but yeah. That, that has always been the case. Um, yeah. uh, what is, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the times of rebellion under communism were almost always linked to economic issues. Yeah. yeah. And, and we like, and we have very much liked in the West to attribute political, uh, you know, fights against dictatorship, whatever. Sure, I mean, this was there too. Of course, people would prefer to be free than, than not to be free, that's clear. But the main impetus for re rebellions has almost always been uh, economically uh, motivated. And so, yeah, I mean, quite clearly, if you uh, deprive people of the way to make a living and uh, to have a, not only a decent life, but sometimes it has come to the point of eating altogether, then of course they won't rebel. And that is completely, um, universal, but it's not linked to any political regime.